Isn't it your duty to respond when, when the president calls the Fed a much bigger problem than China? My duty is one that Congress has given us, which is to use our tools to achieve maximum employment and stable prices, and to supervise and regulate banks so that they treat their customers fairly, and so that they're strong, well-capitalized, and can perform their critical function in good times and bad. That's my job. That's Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell explaining his job. But that job is more complicated today than ever before, which could help explain why the Federal Reserve made a stunning move in March that I believe could spell trouble for the economy and for the financial markets. It's that time again, time to tune out the hype and focus on the facts. Facts that matter to you, the income generation. Let's get started. Get ready to separate reality from myth. With us, David Scranton. David Scranton. David Scranton. David Scranton. But David Scranton says, hey, not so fast. How does it affect the markets? How does it affect the economy? Thanks to efficiencies in new technology and a staff of veteran analysts and portfolio managers, Sound Income Strategies strives to set new standards and bring institutional style investing to your portfolio. I'm David Scranton. The Federal Reserve, more than any other group or individual, has been instrumental in creating the new age of economic uncertainty in which we live. I've used several analogies to explain the Fed's current predicament, walking a tightrope, landing an experimental airplane, etc. Any way you look at it, though, they're in a tough spot. But it's a spot that they put themselves in through years of reckless artificial economic policies, policies that we've discussed ad infinitum on the show. Their challenges have only gotten tougher since President Trump's election. Now, that may explain why the Fed made a stunning move in March that I believe could have serious consequences for the economy and for the financial markets long term. We'll talk about that on today's show. We'll also discuss some of the other challenges facing the Fed right now and what they could mean for everyday investors. Joining us today will be our good friend, economist and business professor, Peter Morisi. But in, in, in something like being a one of the governors you know, basically, you get roasted in the press. And so it was poor Stephen up against the entire Democratic caucus. Along with author Michael Easton, the founder of Fellowship Financial Group in Altamont Springs, Florida. I think it does have a lot to do with the psychological perspective that people have. If they're concerned about uh, uh, spending money, then they're going to close up their wallets. But right now, let's review some of the developments that have taken place since we last talked about the Fed right here on the show. And that was back in December of last year during my 2019 market forecast. Shortly before that episode, the Fed had raised short-term interest rates for the fourth time in 2018 and was still vowing to implement at least two more rate hikes in 2019. Now, as part of my forecast, I predicted that the Fed would be unable to stick to that schedule and would more likely approve zero rate hikes than four. I cited several reasons, the main one being that additional rate hikes could create a dangerous flat or an inverted yield curve. Now, for you regular viewers, you know that I've been warning against this danger since late in 2015. That's when the Federal Reserve first started raising rates again after holding them to near zero for seven years as part of their efforts to jumpstart the economy after the Great Recession. Well, it didn't take long for my forecast to prove accurate. On March 20th, the Fed announced it was changing its own forecast for additional rate hikes this year from two to zero. The announcement came as a little surprise since Chairman Jerome Powell had already taken a new, more dovish tone on interest rates all the way back to January, saying the central bank would be, quote, patient and flexible before adjusting rates again. Since the announcement on March 20th was widely expected, most financial media outlets made very little of it. None really reported it as anything of significance. I, on the other hand, wrote extensively about it in my April newsletter to clients, my blogs, etc., pointing out that the media and the most, and most market analysts missed what I believe was the real news in that announcement. So what was that? You see, in addition to announcing its halt to more rate hikes, the Fed also announced it was planning to discontinue, now listen carefully, to discontinue the unwinding of quantitative easing this year. So why was this discontinuation of the unwinding of quantitative easing so shocking? 
Because to me, it was almost as if the Fed was saying, look, we tried to raise short-term rates. After December, the bond market wouldn't allow us. So if we can't flatten the yield curve by raising short-term rates, well, then, heck, we're going to do it by driving, driving down long-term rates. And, and, and although that's ludicrous, and I'm sure that's not their intention, here's why I say this. My main rationale for forecasting that the Fed would have to scrap its plan for more rate hikes this year was the threat of a flat yield curve. And, of course, this occurs when there's no longer a spread between long-term and short-term rates. Additionally, I'd forecast that threat would persist because long-term interest rates would continue hitting a strong resistance level or a glass ceiling at or below 3%, which has also proven to be the case. In fact, the Fed made its announcement on March 20th, and right before the announcement, the yield on the 10-year Treasury bond was over 2.6%. And with the benchmark federal funds rate at 2.5%, the yield curve was already almost flat. However, within just a couple days afterward, the yield on the 10-year Treasury got down near 2.4%. That officially inverted the yield curve. Now, please understand that there are only two possible ways the Fed could have created a flat yield curve. One is by raising short-term rates, and the other one is by lowering long-term rates. Naturally, there's no logical reason for the Fed to intentionally create a flat yield curve, since not only is it a well-known symptom of a recession, but in many ways it can also be the cause of a recession. And that's why it was a relief when each time throughout 2018, the Fed would announce it was planning another short-term rate hike, and the bond market seemed to accommodate that move. How? Well, bond yields would simply increase slightly with each announcement, giving the Fed just enough room to implement its marginal increases without flattening the yield curve. Of course, as you know, that all changed in the month of December when the bond market seemed to say enough is enough. And that time, long-term interest rates did not rise ahead of the Fed's short-term increase. In fact, they actually dropped. And I believe this factor, more than any other, is the main reason that the Fed announced as early as January that it was putting the brakes on plans for more rate hikes in 2019. In other words, the Fed realized it could no longer continue raising short-term rates without risking a flat yield curve. And that, to me, made sense. But it's also what made their announcement about ending the unwinding of quantitative easing so strange and shocking. Why? Because that didn't make sense. To me, it was the equivalent of saying, once again, if we can't, you know, we can't keep raising short-term rates, well then, heck, we're going to drive down long-term rates and flatten the yield curve that way. Now again, it doesn't make any sense for them to be saying this, and I believe that they're not. But it didn't take long to confirm that my fears actually became the end result. As I said before, just within a few days, the yield curve flattened and actually slightly inverted. And it's been fairly flat ever since that announcement. So how and why exactly did this strange thing happen? And more, most importantly, what might it mean for investors going forward? We're going to talk about this more coming up in just a bit. Now it's time to welcome our first guest, economist Peter Morisi. He's a professor at the Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. Peter is also the former chief economist at the U.S. International Trade Commission. And most importantly, he's a friend of the income generation. And you could follow him on Twitter at at pmorici1. That's at pmorici, M-O-R-I-C-I, -I, and then the numeral one. Peter, thanks for joining us today on the show. You're welcome. Nice to be with you. So I just want to let you know our interview is going to be a little bit longer today than it normally would, in large part because... Uh, Stephen Moore was supposed to be a guest on the show today, and a lot of our viewers, you may or may not know this, but sometimes we pre-record the Income Generation show, and ironically, we're pre-recording this here with Peter on Thursday, uh, the day that Stephen Moore actually withdrew from the nomination for the Federal Reserve Board. So, Peter, what do you think's going on these days? I mean, first of all, why do you think he made the personal decision to withdraw? Well, they were clearly going into his past, and uh, right now it is very difficult for someone to defend themselves, because the absolute worst is made of everything you may have said or done. Uh, 
And, and that's what's going on here. You know, social mores change, which you're permitted to say changes and so forth. And, you know, comments like about women's basketball. Well, you know, there's a context that, in which one says that and there's a time frame. Uh, and so uh, his divorce also, people say all kinds of things in divorce proceedings to try to win. Uh, you know, if he was up for the Supreme Court, it would be more interesting because there'd be big televised panels and, <laughs> you know, he'd have a ch more of a chance to defend himself and to sure. articulate himself. But in, in, in something like being a one of the governors, you know, basically you get roasted in the press. And so it was poor Stephen up against the entire Democratic caucus. Hmm. You know, and I don't blame him for for canceling on the show today, because I'm sure this isn't this. This is probably certainly not in one of his top 10 days of his life. But tell us, you know, what do you think about Stephen Moore in terms of his ability to do the job? Was he a candidate well, that you were behind in this position? I uh, I endorsed him, you know, when asked about it, when he was name was mentioned. Uh, there weren't many economists that did. I would point out that he has a master's degree in economics from George Washington University, which is exactly the same background educationally that Bill McDonough had, who was president of the New York Fed for many years and a permanent member of the Open Market Committee, uh, the first uh, director of that accounting board that we created, um, you know, after uh, the first financial crisis to make sure people did their books properly. Mm -hmm. And so forth. So my feeling is, is that that he had the educational background. Economists that said he didn't have the background were merely jealous that he got the appointment. And also they're liberal Democrats. Mm. Yeah. So there it seems like at this point, the country has become so incredibly divided uh, that it's more divided than ever before. It's almost scary. I mean, do you care to comment on that in the 30 seconds we have left in this segment? Well, a year ago, my wife and I was t were talking. I said, what if they called me and asked me to do a job? And she said, Peter, you'd have it for two weeks, which is about how long Stephen had it. Right. Simply, they dig into everything you've done. You're a controversial figure. And what happened to Stephen, I could see happening to me. So uh, that's the way things are right now. It's very unfortunate. But if you do not politically correct and you're an economist, you're not qualified. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, really appreciate your input on that. Stay with us, Peter. We need to take a commercial break right now. And you stay with us, too. We'll be right back with Peter Morisi here on The Income Generation. We'll be right back. If you're near or in retirement, head over to theincomegeneration.com and download your special report written specifically for the needs of the income generation. Again, those born before 1966. I'm David Scranton, and you've been watching The Income Generation. David J. Scranton, Amazon bestselling author, money manager, and national TV host, is on a mission to educate baby boomers about the need to shift from growth to income. If you're at or near retirement, focusing on income over growth can make all the difference in the quality of your retirement. Each week, David educates America on his Newsmax TV show, The Income Generation, where he provides special reports and more to teach baby boomers about the income model. Call now for a free copy of David's latest book. Go to soundincomestrategies.com slash income to find out more. So why did the Fed's announcement about ending its unwinding of quantitative easing sound to me, like a declaration that it was intentionally trying to flatten the yield curve by driving down long-term rates? Well, first, you need to understand that the whole quantitative easing unwinding effort was intended, at least in part, to manipulate long-term interest rates upward. Remember that throughout quantitative easing from 2007 on, the Fed purchased some $4.5 trillion of U.S. Treasuries starting in October 2017, they gradually began selling these bonds back to the open market. The idea was that by increasing the supply of bonds in the market, they would decrease the price, thereby increasing long-term yields. But like everything else having to do with quantitative easing, the strategy didn't work as well as the Federal Reserve had hoped. Now, although the yield on the 10-year Treasury rate did break above 3% a few times last year, at the height of the Fed's unwinding efforts, it still has consistently shrunken back closer to the 2.5% mark. And as mentioned, I've been forecasting this resistance level for long-term interest rates for many, many years, and I believe that it'll continue for several reasons. Yet, even though the unwinding of quantitative easing wasn't 
putting as much upward pressure on long-term rates as the Fed might have wanted, I was still stunned to hear Jerome Powell state publicly in March that the Fed would stop its unwinding efforts by September of 2019. And here's why. If the unwinding was working to push long-term rates up even slightly, then ending it is going to have the opposite effect. In other words, the Fed is basically telling the markets that it will stop increasing the supply of bonds, which means that if dem demand for bonds remains the same, then prices will rise and long-term yields will come down. And again, there are only two possible ways that the Federal Reserve could create a flat yield curve. One, by raising short-term rates too high, or number two, by manipulating long-term rates too low until they're even with or lower than short-term rates. Sure enough, within days of the announcement, the yield on the 10-year Treasury rate dropped about 30 basis points, as we talked about just a moment ago. Long-term rates across Europe also fell some of the negative territory. On March 22nd, the yield on the 10-year Treasury fell down into the low 2.4 range, lower than the Fed funds rate of 2.5%, making the yield curve completely flat. And as I said before, it's remained there ever since. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, Dave, you must be way off on this one. After all, these are some really smart guys at the Federal Reserve, economics experts of the highest caliber. Why would they do something so foolish? They must have known that the consequences would be risky. Well, to be honest, I really don't think the Fed set out to intentionally flatten the yield curve. I think it was more likely a matter of these incredibly smart people becoming so focused on their data charts, their graphs, their dot plots, that they lost sight of the bigger picture. They forgot to balance all their data with plain old common sense. This can happen. And as a pilot, I'd like to share with you a famous example. In 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 tragically crashed in the Florida Everglades, and it killed more than 100 people that were on board. Investigators later learned that the airplane went down because its entire crew had become too focused on a warning light that was telling them that one of their sources of landing gear is malfunctioning. Now, in their efforts focusing on this warning light, no one noticed that the autopilot had actually put the plane in a gradual descent. And by the time they did notice it, it was too late. So in spite of all their training and all their intelligence, they were so focused on reading that one gauge and trying to interpret it that they failed to notice the bigger problem, that the plane was going down. And I think that may be a fitting analogy for what's happening with the Federal Reserve right now. They become so focused on data and on details, and frankly, so comfortable with the idea that hey, we're the Federal Reserve, we can artificially manipulate anything if we want, that they've lost sight of the bigger picture. They've lost sight of common sense. So what is the bigger picture? Well, the bigger picture is the long-term direction of the economy and the financial markets. And as far as that goes, I believe the Fed's flattening of the yield curve, intentional or not, may amount to their having put the plane into a gradual descent without noticing. And we'll talk about that coming up here in just a bit. Let's bring back an economist, business professor, and friend of the income generation, Peter Morisi. You can follow him on Twitter at, at pmorisi1. Peter, thanks for sticking around. Nice to be with you again. Okay, I've got to try one more time here. If I call the president, I mean, I know your credentials. You and I have spoken several times here on the show. You're more than qualified for this position. If I call the president, and I talk him into making the offer to you, and then I call your wife, and I talk her into giving you a permission slip to run for this, okay? Will you do it? Can I get you to do it? No, I don't think so, because I don't think I would, I don't think I would uh, get past the Senate, just like Stephen. I don't have a divorce or anything like that, but, you know, any kind of ding, and uh, they will, I mean, I'm 70 years old. There's a lot to dig up. You know, I, I can't imagine what it would be, but they'd find it. No, I, I think that you just have to be, if you know, you're conservative and you're skeptical of political correctness and all this business, it's going to be very difficult to pass muster now unless you're a Harvard professor with a distinguished record. But then again, those guys don't get into political issues. Right. You can't be, a, I guess this is the bottom line. You can't be a creature of Washington and, and take one of these appointments right now. Okay, so I get it. You don't want Congress sift, snit, uh, sifting through your underwear drawer. I can't blame you for that. Well, I, what I don't want to do is have an unsuccessful adventure. 
you know, I, I, I don't like unsuccessful projects. Do you? No, no. You, you go in to win. I understand that completely. And in this case, to help. The problem is poor Stephen Moore was just trying to, you know, help our country. But so let's get away from that for a minute. Let's talk you don't about get rich serving on the Fed, by the way. What's that? You don't get rich serving on the Fed. It's a nice salary, but it's but being on the Fed Board of Governors doesn't make you rich. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't think I don't think Stephen was going to have a pay increase out of all this. Right, right. No. And I know same is true with you for a man of your socioeconomic status, who would be just a drop in the bucket. So so let's change the subject <laughs> for just a minute here. Uh, so the economy, you know, we got some preliminary news about first quarter GDP growth, maybe being over 3%. Uh, the, the quarterly earnings reports from corporate America seem good. What's going on? Are we, are we on the upswing here? You tell me. Oh, I think we're in very, very good shape. It, not only are we growing because people are out there spending, but productivity growth is really bouncing along over the last four quarters. Over the last year, productivity has increased at a rate of about 2.4% per annum. Now, that's akin to the good old days uh, before both Bush and Obama, when the when the economy generated, you know, much more substantial growth during the uh, Reagan uh, first Bush uh, Clinton prosperity. We grew at three and a half percent a year because we had productivity growth that was about two and a half. It's actually three point four and two point four. Mm -hmm. So then in the, in the minute we have left in the segment, tell us then, why do you think President Trump is pushing so incredibly hard here for more rate cuts if we're already growing well, at a reasonable pace? Presidents like lower interest rates. Businessmen who borrow money like lower interest rates. It's sort of instinctive. I don't think we need a 1% cut. I think we're comfortable where we are. Uh, I, I, I hope that the Fed is prepared to cut rates if we start to have troubles, but I don't think that we will. Do you think the Fed will be the Fed will be patient then, like they promised they would, uh, at least for the next three months? Oh yes, I think the Good. Fed will be patient. Unless the economy goes south, they'll be patient. They're going to be very cautious about raising rates because inflation is fairly low, and it's it's likely to stay that way. And that was that was Stephen Moore's argument. I agree completely. So we need to take another one of those pesky commercial breaks, but we'll be right back. You stay with us. We'll be right back here with Peter Morisi on the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. We'll be right back with you. If you're near or in retirement, head over to theincomegeneration.com and download your special report written specifically for the needs of the income generation. Again, those be born before 1966. I'm David Scranton, and you've been watching The Income Generation. We'll see you all next Sunday. David J. Scranton, Amazon bestselling author, money manager, and national TV host, is on a mission to educate baby boomers about the need to shift from growth to income. If you're at or near retirement, focusing on income over growth can make all the difference in the quality of your retirement. Each week, David educates America on his Newsmax TV show, The Income Generation, where he provides special reports and more to teach baby boomers about the income model. Call now for a free copy of David's latest book. Go to soundincomestrategies.com slash income to find out more. Now, you've probably read or heard some opinions in recent weeks that have totally downplayed the significance of this thing called an inverted yield curve. Most of these arguments fall into a familiar category for financial journalism, and that is, this time, it will be different. It's a message you hear trumpeted by much of the financial media whenever warning signs are mounting, for example, that the next recession or the next major stock market correction might be just around the corner. And make no mistake, historically speaking, a flat or inverted yield curve is one of the most consistently reliable sources of those warning signs. Now, according to one study by the San Francisco Fed, an inverted yield curve has preceded all nine recessions that have occurred since 1955. In each and every case, the recession hit in the following six to 24 months of the yield curve's inversion. Naturally, the analysts arguing that this time will be different always have plenty of data to support their argument, and some of it may even sound reasonable. It might seem to make sense analytically, but as we just talked about with the Fed, it's always important to make sure you don't get caught up in the data and that you ignore common sense. Common sense is what, what prompt you to ask, 
how likely is it that this time it'll really be different? If each of the last nine times in the last 64 years, it's always been the same. Now, if you're a regular viewer, you've heard me explain before why a flatter inverted yield curve can be so dangerous and how it can go from becoming a symptom of a recession to actually being the cause of a recession. So to put it simply, banks depend on having a spread between short-term and long-term interest rates in order to make lending worthwhile. Banks typically borrow short-term and lend long-term and needs that spread to make money off those loans. If, however, there's very little or no difference between short-term and long-term rates, or if long-term rates are actually lower than short-term rates, meaning inverted yield curve, then banks of all sizes can end up taking a hit. In fact, many big banks have already reported the crunch from the inverted yield curve, and they've said that it's hurting their top-line growth and forcing them to scale back their earnings forecast for 2019. The impact on smaller regional banks might be even worse due to their lack of other financial services to fuel other revenue streams. They depend on things like home and auto loans and on having a yield curve steep enough to make money off these loans. You see, with a flat yield curve, many end up tightening their underwriting standards and approving far fewer loans. Now, naturally, that's not only bad for the bank, but it's bad for the whole economy, and it can start a domino effect toward recession. Eventually, if that domino effect starts, that means that fewer homes are purchased, fewer cars are purchased, consumers start spending less in various areas, production falls because of decreased demand, companies start laying off employees, and the spiral just continues. That's how this flat yield curve could quickly go from becoming a, being really a symptom of a recession to becoming a major cause of recession. Naturally, a recession would be the worst possible news for the stock market, which already dropped nearly 60% in conjunction with the last recession. That, of course, was the Great Recession. And for many Americans, the goal to recovery has been every bit as long and as challenging on a personal level as it has been for the economy as a whole. I know from experience as a financial advisor that many people are still focused on recouping losses. And they're still focused on saving, paying off debts, and better protecting their assets for retirement. And net-net, that's actually a good thing. But as I mentioned before, it's also part of the reason why all the Fed's artificial efforts to stimulate the economy and manip manipulate interest rates lower has fallen short. Yes, all the textbooks do say that when a governmental entity prints money, which is basically what the Fed's doing here with quantitative easing, it'll grow the economy. The textbooks say that it'll grow the economy because it gives consumers more money to spend. But what the textbooks never consider is what happens if that money isn't spent. What happens if instead consumers save it, invest it in other investment strategies because they've been already burnt by two major stock market drops? Uh, and recessions over the last 20 years. And this all occurred during their prime years of saving for retirement. Well, the answer as to what happens then is what we've been seeing for the last 10 years. And that is a creation of an asset recovery more than economic recovery. An overinflated stock market that gets out of whack with economic fundamentals. Why? Because people are getting pushed up the yield curve and taking more risk because of a Fed so focused on artificiality and experimentation that yes, it's ignoring common sense. And that's where I want to bring back in business professor and economist Peter Morisi. You can follow him once again on Twitter at at pmorisi1. That's at pmorisi, the numeral one. Peter, thanks for sticking around for this last segment. You're welcome. So, okay. Controversy here. You know, a lot of people are talking about the flattening of the yield curve. Uh, I was kind of shocked with this last move by the Federal Reserve. Uh, not that they were not raising short-term rates anymore. I understand why they'd want to discontinue that because we don't have the signs of inflation, as you indicated a moment ago. But I was shocked that they were going to discontinue the reversal of quantitative easing, essentially helping to flatten out the yield curve. And I know today a lot of economists are saying, well, this time it's different. Uh, a flat yield curve is not necessarily an indicator of uh, recession. My concern, though, is that a, a flat yield curve can create a recession because you really impede banks' desire to lend. What are your thoughts on this latest Fed move, and what are your thoughts on this ability to actually possibly create a recession if we're not careful? 
Well, I think you need to remember that because of the dramatic internationalization of the dollar, so many people use the dollar now to settle trade accounts and to invest and so forth, that the Fed doesn't have a lot of control over long-term yields. Uh, if they start to inch up, foreign money comes in to take advantage of them because conditions are what they are in Europe. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's one of the reasons the yield curve inverted. It wasn't because right. of expectations here about the economy. Uh, in terms but, of the dip... But Peter, the, I would say it's not about expectations, but uh, we were getting really close to a flat yield curve. And then well, when the Fed the made this announcement on March 20th, uh, essentially the 10-year Treasury yield dropped by about 25 basis points, essentially going it, from almost flat to flat. So I agree it wasn't the major factor, but it's kind of like the icing on the cake, is it not? No, I don't think so. My feeling is that uh, we live in a different era when it comes to the yield curve. It's a shorthand for other things that are going on in the economy. Expectations are what it's all about. And the domestic expectations are positive. Foreign expectations about their economies are negative. But more and more, we have their currency. Uh, so many transactions are cleared in terms of dollars now. So many companies abroad hold dollars. Individuals investors hold dollars, that if the yield goes up here, they're going to rush in. And so efforts to raise the yield curve by boosting the federal funds rate, by boosting the deposit rate on excess reserves and so forth, is not going to do much to move the long-term curve. You have to ask yourself, why is the yield curve moving? Not just has it moved. But, it, but my only concern is that, okay, it has moved, and regardless of what the forces are, it still gives banks somewhat of a disincentive to lend, does it not? Uh, yes, it does. I mean, but they would get 4% on their money long term. There's very little interest rate risk because it's unlikely that rates are going to go much lower. Mm -hmm. uh, and, well, excuse me, there is some interest rate risk because rates could go higher. But there isn't a really large risk in that regard because conditions abroad are so poor. You know, I don't really expect that real interest rates are going to be much higher in Europe for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've thrown absolutely everything they can at the system over there. They're running out of stuff to buy, this, the, the European Central Bank, and they can't move the needle. And that's because the dysfunctions in their structure, the euro, mm -hmm. the budget structures and things like that. Certainly, certainly. And that's why we're so fortunate here in the U.S. that actually our policies are working. So, Peter, we need to leave it there for today. Thanks so much for being on the show. Once again, we really appreciate it. Take care. And you stay with us here on The Income Generation. We'll be back with much, much more. I'm David Scranton, and you're watching The Income Generation. David J. Scranton, Amazon bestselling author, money manager, and national TV host, is on a mission to educate baby boomers about the need to shift from growth to income. If you're at or near retirement, focusing on income over growth can make all the difference in the quality of your retirement. Each week, David educates America on his Newsmax TV show, The Income Generation, where he provides special reports and more to teach baby boomers about the income model. Call now for a free copy of David's latest book. Go to soundincomestrategies.com slash income to find out more. The U.S. economy will soon surpass 10 years of steady economic expansion, matching the longest period of expansion in history. The Federal Reserve has played a crucial role in reaching that milestone, but as we've seen on today's show, it's played that role in a highly unconventional and historically unprecedented manner. As I see it, the Fed's overuse of quantitative easing and attempted manipulation of the markets has amounted to one massive experiment in global economics. Why? Because in addition to their own experimentation, they inspired other central banks around the world to undertake experiments of their own, many of which are still underway. With the global economy so interdependent today, those quantitative easing efforts abroad are already influencing our markets in various ways and could still have much greater impacts down the road. This is why I say that the Fed, more than any other entity, is responsible for this new age of economic uncertainty in which we live. And that uncertainty has only increased in the last two years, heightened by the contentious relationship between the Federal Reserve and the Trump administration, which is also to an unprecedented level. 
when President Trump appointed Jerome Powell as Fed chairman early in his presidency, it was with the understanding that Powell would continue the normalization of monetary policy that began under his predecessor, Janet Yellen. That meant continuing the process of trying to wean the economy off of quantitative easing, part of which meant continuing the process of raising short-term rates. But then, when the stock market started experiencing increased levels of volatility last year, largely you know, due to worries about burgeoning trade war, President Trump began harshly criticizing the Fed for sticking to its schedule. He went as far as saying that the central bank has gone crazy and even looked into whether or not he has the authority to fire Powell. Now, whether you're a fan of the president or not, all this criticism has the potential to undermine investor confidence in the Federal Reserve. But this confidence is critical and also makes their current tightrope that they're walking all the more challenging. Could this unprecedented level of political pressure and scrutiny prompt a misstep by the Fed that serves as a tipping point for the next major market collapse? Well, in this unprecedented age of economic uncertainty, no one knows. But I would argue that the Fed has already demonstrated it's capable of taking dangerous mistakes, dangerous missteps. How? By flattening the yield curve. Here's the bottom line for investors at or near retirement age. Be prepared for anything. But please, be prepared. And that's where I'd like to bring in our next guest, author Michael Eastham, who wrote the book Common Sense Income Strategies. Michael's also a CPA and the founder of Fellowship Financial Group in Altamont Springs, Florida. But most importantly, he's a friend of the income generation and a personal friend of yours truly. Michael, thanks so much for being on the show today. It's always good to be here, Dave. So we got some good, you know, you, you sort of, Peter Morisi's comments on the economy and the good, uh, the, the good preliminary GDP report for the first quarter that shows GDP growth over 3%. Uh, what do you think is fueling that? And do you think it's sustainable? Or do you think it was just pent up demand and we'll go back into the twos before the end of the year? I think there is, there is some strength in the market, in uh, the economy, but I think there is definitely some concern on a lot of people's minds about the fact that the stock market itself is still so very high. We've just seen the last couple of days where there's been a little bit of weakness in the markets. And uh, over the last couple of months, it's just been vacillating up and down. So I think that right there is indicative of the fact that people there, there's not a lot of confidence driving the market. And uh, in order to continue a strong market upward, well, you, you do have to have a solid and I think there has to be a lot of confidence in the economy. So you're more concerned about the psychological impact of it. Yep. Uh, so in other words, you're probably concerned also about what we call the reverse wealth effect that, you know, should the stock market start to take a drop just because it's been so long since it's happened. And even if the economy is strong, that now, gee, psychologically, if people feel poorer, that could hurt the economy. They might slow down their spending. Yeah, I talk about that quite a bit with uh, when folks come into my office, just about the realities of if you're this close to retirement and, you know, within a couple of years of retirement, what's the impact of a 20, 30, 40 percent drop on the market? What is that going to have on your ability to feel confident that you're going to meet your retirement goals? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something that I think people think about in the back of their minds, but just the, uh, the volatility of the market and questions about the real strength in the economy is, uh, is causing them to pause. Well, think about it. Even a young guy like yourself, right, a young whippersnapper, uh, you know, if you see your retirement accounts going down by 20, 30 percent, you may not use the money for a long time, but it's going to affect you. You're, you're going to be you're going you're to pull back a little bit. So, uh, of course, uh, that doesn't really count for you. You're a CPA and you're conservative by nature. So you don't spend anything anyway. Your, your wife tells me all about it. So uh, uh, we, need to, we need to leave it there for this block. We can take commercial breaks. Stay with us, Michael, please. And you stay with us also. We have much more in the terms of great words of wisdom here from our good friend, Michael Eastham, on the income generation. We'll be right back. For behind-the-scenes photos, retirement planning tips, and upcoming giveaways, follow the Income Generation Show on Facebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch video clips, guest interviews, and to catch up on past episodes. Welcome back to the Income Generation. We're here talking with Michael Eastham, author of Common Sense Income Strategies. Michael's also a CPA, as well as the founder of Fellowship Financial Group in Altamont Springs, Florida. 
and a good friend of the income generation. Michael, thanks for sticking around. My pleasure, Dave. So, you know, I had a lot of concern back in March when the Federal Reserve uh, took some steps to somewhat flatten the yield curve by discontinuing the reversal of quantitative easing. Uh, but do you think that if the Fed can just finally stay out of it and stay patient like they seem to be promising they will, do you, do you think that they can really keep from snuffing off the growth that we're having in the economy? Or do you think maybe their hands-off approach is just a little too late? Well, I think at some point in later this year, we are going to see a bit of a pullback in the economy. And uh, and I think the Fed is going to have something to do with it. It's it's really unfortunate that uh, that I, it seems like there's definitely some manipulation on the long-term rates to intentionally flatten the yield curve, which is mind-boggling to me because – as you know, Dave, that you know the banks are not going to lend if you got a flat yield curve, which is going to bring the economy to a screeching halt, and and that I think is going to hurt the the mindset of many people. We mentioned it in the, the last segment. I think it does have a, a lot to do with the psychological perspective that people have. If they're concerned about uh, uh, spending money, then they're going to close up their wallets. If they're concerned about the strength of their 401ks and retirement savings. Well, especially those people that are, you know, viewers of the income generation and re in the red zone of retirement, those are the folks that are going to clam up their wallets. They're going to be much more cautious, and that's going to have, you know, a, a kind of a cycling effect on the economy as well. Now, I know you're a little bit biased, you know, a guy who writes a book called Common Sense Income Strategies, but I'd like you to take the last minute or so and just tell our income generation viewers, what do you think they need to be doing today when it comes to their money? I mean, it's great that the the headwind against bonds and bond-like instruments has essentially stopped because interest rates stopped going up. But now we have this fear of recession coming around the corner. What's the best advice you'd give to those members of the income generation? I think the best advice I can give them is the same stuff that, uh, that I've been talking about for several years now, which is why do you have to be aggressive or why do you feel the need to be aggressive in the market? Um, if your income goals are met or if you've got – the modest goals that 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 your investments are able to meet, well, then why take additional risk when you don't have to? I think we're all after the same thing. We want maximum return for minimum risk. But um, at the same time, if you've got to try to satisfy goals in retirement, then you need to make sure that you're invested in instruments that are designed to generate income. Sure. And you just don't need to take as much risk, I think, as too many people are, are out there taking too close to retirement. It sounds like you're, you agree with me that right now the risk in the stock market is much greater than the reward. So, Michael, thanks sure. so much for being on the show once again. It's my pleasure, Dave. Thanks so much for having me. Stick with us. We'll be right back in a minute here on The Income Generation. We'll be right back. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our guests for joining us for another episode of The Income Generation. But more importantly, I'd like to thank you, our new and returning viewers. You know, just a few weeks ago, we marked the 107th anniversary of the sinking of the RMS Titanic, one of the most famous disasters in history. As most people know, this brand new, supposedly unsinkable ship hit an iceberg in the North Atlantic on its maiden voyage from England to New York City. And the story of the Titanic, I believe, actually provides another good analogy for a few things that we've discussed on today's show. See, the Titanic wasn't the first ship to hit an iceberg in that part of the Atlantic and sink. Such disasters were not uncommon. And yet, with the Titanic, a lot of very smart engineers and experienced seamen argued that this time it would be different. Their arguments were all based on sound analysis and strong data. The ship's design was unique. It had advanced safety features like watertight compartments, automated watertight doors. Its engines were revolutionary. Yet with all their focus on the data and the detailed analysis, one could argue those experts ignored plain old common sense. Common sense would have told them to reduce their speed when they received iceberg warnings from other ships, but they didn't. Common sense would have certainly told them that they should have enough lifeboats on board to accommodate every single passenger, but they didn't. As for those passengers, 1,500 of whom lost their lives, how many would have boarded the ship if they had known that there were enough lifeboats to hold about half of them? I'm sure many still would have because they trusted the experts that the ship was unsinkable. The data was sound. Others, however, I'm sure, would have had second thoughts. 
They might have agreed the data seemed sound, but common sense would have told them that there was still a risk, and a very grave risk if worse comes to worse, which of course is exactly what happened. Now, I'm not trying to say I definitely see our economy and stock market as a titanic steaming toward an iceberg. That's not the point I'm trying to make. The point is that I get concerned when I see the Federal Reserve make a move that actually increases the risk of recession and another major market downturn at a time when there are already plenty of risks sitting here now in place. I kind of sort of wonder if they've lost the sight of the big picture. I wonder if all the analysts claiming that this time will be different are simply ignoring common sense. But most of all, I hope that investors, income generation members, at or near retirement age realize that it's up to you to protect yourselves from a potential disaster. How? By reducing your market risk and making protection and income your top priority. Thanks for watching. If you're close to retirement and you really want to know how to protect and maximize your money, it's absolutely essential that you stay informed and up to date. And as you know, Right here is where you can do it on the income generation. I'm David Scranton, and we'll see you next week.